10. We'll start in 10, and I'm going to read from there. I haven't, um, Luke is, Luke is a third gospel, and Luke was a physician. So, whenever we read Luke, um, we can see that, we see a lot of times that, depending on the person that is writing the book, you will see a different style of writing, or you'll see a different, uh, different terminology and different things. Uh, Luke, you'll notice in, in some places he'll give more of a professional's uh, description of, say, like Judas, whenever he hung himself. In Luke, it says something about, you know, he fell headlong into something, you know, so it's real technical. But uh, it, it's, you know, whenever we see the four Gospels, we look at it, it, what it is, it's four witnesses. It's four, four men <clears throat> that everybody knew of. In that time, um, you know, four men that were not not connected to Jesus Christ. Four men that had their own lives, um, their own businesses, their own everything. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, you also notice that you have four men that have distinct skills. In you know, like Matthew was a um, he was a tax collector. When we say that. We say that as, oh, he was a tax collector. In those days, tax collectors were not looked on at favorably at all. Well, no, wait, those days. Well, yeah, so, so they, but it wasn't necessarily, um, it wasn't that that made him an outcast because, see, Matthew was a Jew, and he was a tax collector. Well, Jews don't, they don't receive taxes. So he could only be collecting taxes for one person or one other entity, which was the Romans. So to the Jews, he was hated because he's taking money from the Jews and he's giving it to the Romans, which is his job. It's not like he was doing it, you know, out of any, he wasn't breaking any laws. That was his job. Um, but then also the Romans hated him. I mean, they used him for his job, but he was a Jew. You know, so, um, but that's not the reason, uh, or that, that's some of the reasons I would say that, that he was picked, but there's a, there's a real interesting you know, tax collectors and, and accountants and stuff like that, they wrote shorthand. And he was able to follow, because everything I've read about Matthew, he wasn't a very, you know, he wasn't, if anybody, he wasn't a very uh, outgoing, outspoken person as far as that goes. He kept very, very good records, just like every accountant that you know. You know, every CPA you know, they're very methodical on records. So if you look at what Jesus or who Jesus had to write these gospels, it was, uh, you know, you had a, a tax collector. You had Luke was a physician. Luke also wrote the Acts of the Apostles. Luke's kind of distanced from everyone else, all the other disciples. You don't see a whole lot about them. Um, Mark, too. We know that Mark, he, he was with Paul at times. Uh, but it's four distinct accounts. And it'd be like if we're in court trying to prove something, and you know, we would call Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they each give their account of what happened. This is how it unfolded. We look at those, we compare them, and we make sure that their testimony is true. And that's how. That's why in here it says uh, we don't go off of the word of one person. You know, it's it's three or four is the best, but. It's always more than one. Uh, you, can't, you can't take somebody's word if it's just one person, if they're talking about something that happened or if they're making an accusation. So we'll start in chapter 10. Let's go to the Lord. And uh, I'm just going to read. I'm just going to read to until uh, I get tired of reading, I guess. <laughs> There's something in there that, that kind of popped in my head this morning that I wanted to get to, but I, we'll see if I get to it, because I don't remember exactly where it's at, so we'll, we'll go from, we'll just start at 10, we'll, we'll roll those dice. Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us back here, Lord, that we can worship and learn and rejoice that we have a God who listens, a God who cares, a God who's always there that never leaves us, Lord. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you do and the blessings that you 
just continue to pour out in our lives. Lord, we thank you for all the prayers that you've answered. And Lord, we just ask that you would continue to work in our lives and around us and through us. Lord, we just ask this morning that you would clear us, that you would clear our minds and get all the garbage that's in there from this week, from, from the past, from the car ride here, Lord, anything that was worldly that got into our heads, that you would clear us of that this morning. You would remove those thoughts, remove those those hindrances that's stopping us from getting into your word. Lord, any sin that we may have on us, any anything that we may have done that we haven't fully gave to you, Lord, we ask that you would remove those things from us and you give us the ability to lay them at your feet and we could move on. Lord, that you would remove anything that is separating us from walking next to you, from being with you, from hearing your call, from feeling your presence. Lord, we ask that you would remove those things and you would open your book to us, that your words would be our words, that you would write them on our hearts and they would begin to take over our members, that they would follow your word without thought. Lord, that your spirit would guide us, completely fill us, and continue to help us grow and be more like Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so <clears throat> chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whether he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Do not go not from house to house. And into whatsoever city ye enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. And heal the sick that are therein. And say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. But into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you not, go your ways out into the streets of the same, and say, Even the very dust of your city, which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works had been done, Tyre and Sidon, which have been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And thou Capernaum, uh, Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, shalt be thrust down to hell. He that heareth you heareth me, and he that despiseth you despiseth me, and he that despiseth me despiseth him that sent me. And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. That's a very important verse. Uh, in verse 20. 
It's funny, I, I didn't really, I, I started here because I was going for, a, I was actually going for somewhere over an 11 or 12. But these, what I've just read, I have probably talked to, I've said something out of that, with the parts we just read to, to probably 50 people in the last two weeks. Yeah, not even, not even really knowing where it was, just knowing that it was in here. But uh, it's amazing that that's, and it's all together too. That's interesting. But I it just, it's it's amazing how God works with that, and He puts us where we need to be in our in our Bibles. Um, always keep that in mind. If you don't know where to start, just start. God will get you where you need to go. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not. Um, I'm just I'm going to go over that real quick because it's really really important because we see a lack of this today. Uh, there's a very very big. See this is. This is a, a picture of a corrupt church here whenever you disregard this. So what, what he's saying in 19, uh, well, I'll start at 17. And the 70 returned again with joy. So these are his disciples, and they came back, and they're saying, Hey, Lord, even the devils, we even have power over the devils in your name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power. And see, Christ himself is giving power to his disciples here. So he's giving power to them to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Understand, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Um, there is a separation between Jesus literally talking to the men that are standing in front of them and giving them an anointing of power to go and to tread on scorpions and stuff. I'm not saying that these things are not attainable to an extent for us. But don't go grab a scorpion or nothing this evening because you know Jesus Christ. You know what I mean? Sorry, Lord. I'm going the other way. Yeah, so, you know, and it's uh, my, my whole thing is, you, you shouldn't be casting out demons. You, couldn't, you shouldn't be treading on serpents and scorpions and all that. If you've got any sin in your life whatsoever, you probably go, that's probably going to go the opposite direction when you try to do the magic trick. So I would say that if you really, if you really in order for anything like this to ever happen, you've got to be so in communion with God that you know you know he's taking care of it. So let's not, you know, I, I'm not going to say it cannot happen. I believe that God heals. I know he heals. Um, but I want to read 20 because notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you. That's my, that's my point is you see a lot of churches, a lot of places, and, you know, they've taken this, He's, Jesus is his words saying, don't rejoice in the fact that I give you this power. And don't rejoice in the fact that you have this power. Um, that, you know, that the spirits are subject unto you. That, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And that's important to me because whenever we have, whenever we think of church, right? What do we come to do? Well, we don't come for a holy miracle healing every time we don't come for uh to tread on scorpions we don't come to play with snakes we don't come for you know things like that we don't rejoice in the powers that god gives we don't necessarily boast or rejoice in that um we will glorify god with those things whenever he allows us or whenever he puts that anointing on us that we can do something we glorify god but the attraction, the attraction is not that. And, and you see some churches today, that's the attraction, right? Uh, you do this and, and God's going to heal this. And you do this or you just come here. God's going to do this. You buy this packet of miracle water or whether it's a, a cloth or whatever it is. You know, um, notwithstanding, rejoice not in the fact that the spirits are subject unto you but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. What, what's the attraction to church? What's Jesus Christ? Is, we're coming to, to thank God that we're never going to die. That, that's it. I mean, everything else is really irrelevant. We're, we're coming in, into God's house as a body of believers to thank him 
for what he's done, to rejoice. Rejoice in the fact that he gave his life so that we may live. And, you know, we come here rejoicing in fellowship together, praying, asking God to help us. And these miracles do happen in church. They happen all the time. It's not the main attraction. It's not what gets people through the door. You know, it's not. And we, we have to be careful of that because then you just become this magic, magic power. You know, and, and that's what you're advertising to people. What sets the church apart is Jesus Christ. Nothing after that. His, his work on the cross, his atonement. We don't need miracles. We don't need to see miracles. We don't need to see people miraculously healed. And whenever I say that, I mean by laying on of hands. We have seen some miraculous healings. Don't get me wrong. But that was a big body of believers that was praying diligently and just humbly asking the Father in the name of Jesus Christ to please help this person. It wasn't a bam, 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 big man of God, you're healed. Don't rejoice in yourself. Don't rejoice in the powers that God gave you. Don't rejoice in the fact that we are, we do have um, a type of dominion over these spirits if we're in our word, if we're obeying. Don't rejoice in that. Rejoice in what Jesus Christ did and the fact that your name is written in the book of life and you're never going to die. All these other things come after that. If these guys had not known Jesus and had not been talking to Jesus, they would have never got this revelation. If they'd have stayed on their boats because the fish were catch, they were catching that day or because their bills were due, you know, that's one thing we don't take into account. These guys, they live normal lives. And this man walks up one day. Had they not read their Bibles, had they not been raised in a Christian home or, or, or a Jew, uh, Jewish home, they, they may not have known who this man was. But by the grace of God, when he walked up and he talked to those fishermen, they, they tossed their nets. They didn't care how much they cost and anything. They followed him. So it's, a, it's important because you'll never see any of these things, ever, if you're not following the man that, that instituted them. That's the whole point. People get a little bit of Jesus, and then they want to tread on scorpions, and they want to heal, and they want to be a miracle worker, and... I'm just here to tell you, uh, that's not how this works. You know, we, uh, we rejoice in what Christ did. He is the final. He's done it all. We don't need him to heal nobody. You know why? Because he heals them at their last breath. It's the perfect healing. Any healing that takes place on earth is going to undo itself over time. You know, we can heal somebody, heal them from cancer, Doctors heal all the time. Prayer heals all the time. Prayer uses doctors and medicine and all those things. We see the healing, but every one person dies. So it's just a matter of time before it turns and goes the other way. So let's not rejoice in the temporary things. Let's rejoice in the eternal things. That's why God says, focus on the promises. You focus too much, even on miracle healing here, it's going to run out. The person you healed today is going to die someday, right? So don't focus on those things. Focus on Jesus Christ, and he will apply these things to your life, and he will help you to actually be a part of some of these things. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in his spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, this is actually Jesus Christ talking to his father. Um, that's always important. So we see that this is, a, this is his prayer, and this is him uh, rejoicing in his spirit to God the Father. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father. For so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me of my Father. And no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father. And who the Father is but the Son. And he to him the Son will reveal him. And he turned unto his disciples and said privately, 
Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you, many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which you see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? Notice in, in Christ's life, every time someone gave him a question, sometimes every time he knew that someone was provoking him, and, and it, it points that out, um, it says it tempted him. So every time that happens, uh, notice how Jesus Christ handles the situation. He gives them a perfectly logical and fitting question not a question just to fill time not a question just to say i really don't want to answer your question but he's actually drawing more information from the person that's asking the question there's a reason for that because if someone is asking a question just strictly to get a rise out of you their question is baseless so if you ask them a real question back their their, their question is irrelevant because it didn't have a purpose anyways other than to get a rise. Once you ask that question back to them, that's a relevant question. They, can't know, they can no longer focus on getting a rise out of you because now they have a real question they must answer. And then if they can't answer that question, obviously if you asked it, you probably know the answer and it's a genuine question. So whether they can answer it or not, you can help them. So I just, I, I like to study and I like to see how how Jesus actually handles his situations as a man and, and try to apply that in our life. Because if we don't, the human nature side of us and the people we're dealing with really comes through really fast. He said unto him, what is written in the law? And how readest thou? And he answering, and he answering said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all of thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Understand that, you know, this man stood up to provoke, to tempt, and he asked a question to to get a, get a specific answer out of Jesus, to get something out of him. Uh, the question was, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus doesn't just launch off into his, you know, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God and all this. You know, he didn't just run, just jump off into scripture. He actually engaged the guy to get him to really think about even the question he was asking. And then he says, the guy answered his, the, the question that Jesus had, and he answered it correctly. And when Jesus knowledge, acknowledged that, so the guy knew the answer to his own question that he had asked. You see, the guy answered his own question whenever he answered Jesus' question. And the reason, so whenever that was the temptation, right? That was he tempted Christ. Because Christ has been telling people to follow me, follow me, and you'll have eternal life. Follow me. And, you know, and so that was the question. When somebody raised, you've been telling people every day, and you've got these masses following you because they're inheriting eternal life by following you because you've been telling them that. You have one guy in the room goes, how, we get to, how do we have eternal life? So that was the question. That was the tempting of it makes you want to say, have you not been listening the whole time I've been talking? Right? So he asked the question back. The man answers his own question. And then whenever, uh, in 29, he says, but he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, 
and who is my neighbors? Because it's uh, love the, your, thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus told him that he answered right, and if he does those things, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. If those, those two things can be done, you have eternal life. But we know we can't do those. I mean, without the help of Jesus Christ, we, you can't love your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and your whole being your whole life. It's impossible. Um, and, but with Christ, it does. It fills those gaps. It, 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 we're covered in his righteousness, and it actually is something that we can grab a hold to and we feel and we know that we have a love for God. He has a love for us and it becomes something that is attainable. But after much, much studying and devotion and being in Christ and being filled with the Spirit, um, it's not something that is an immediate thing or anything like that. So the man basically knew the two commandments he answered he could not do. Now, I want you to see that when he is willing to justify himself, he said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering, so Jesus telling him the story of who his neighbor is, and he makes a very, very, um, he's very, he pinpoints who he's talking about because he says there was a certain priest that way, and there was a sick man that uh, he was half dead, and he was on the side of the street, and he points out that a priest and a Levite, which is a priest. So there's a couple of priests. They both, they seen the man, they seen his sickness, and they, they departed. They went to the other side of the road. They went to the other side of the road so they could walk by him and not see him, not acknowledge him. These are men of God, right? They're supposed to see the sick and go to them. But, you know, Jesus is showing the nature of man, even the religious man. Even, you know, the so-called holy man, even they have a tendency to want to cross the road and get away from things that are uncomfortable or things maybe we don't uh, want to do whenever it comes to godly things. And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, which is also a priest, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. They seen him, they looked on him, and they passed by on the other side. We see that all the time. But there came a certain Samaritan. Samaritans were not accepted, okay? That's why it's a big deal whenever it says the good Samaritan, because the Samaritans were outcasts. And Jews did not talk to Samaritans, and Samaritans did not talk to Jews. That's why the woman at the well was a very big deal. You had not just any Jew, you're not just any prophet or priest, but you had the Messiah that approached a Samaritan at a well, asked her for a drink of water, and led her to himself. And so, and that was, I think, one of the first people that Christ led to the kingdom of God through himself. That was one of the first people. Why that Samaritan? Because Jesus Christ is breaking down walls. That's what he came here to do. He, he came here to get rid of what has separated us since the beginning of time, sin. And, you know, knowing that he's coming to, to crush Satan's head and to finish sin and death once for all, he's got to have these social outcasts, these people that are looked down on, these people that everybody, uh, that everybody has grown to discard, hate, or persecute. They have grown, that has, that has become basically their law. That's basically become the way they live life. That's what we do right now. We have grown to persecute. We've grown to hate. We've grown to look at someone and their circumstance, and we've grown to make them an outcast as a society, as a whole. It's very interesting that you, Jesus uses the outcast. He uses the one that everyone persecutes, everyone hates, the one that's not accepted in every case. Um, even in his parables, he is speaking. This is not something that actually happened. 
This is something that Jesus is talking about. He's giving an example. But look at this example. The two ungodly people are the priest. And the godly man is the outcast that no one will talk to. But it's in his heart, you see. On the outside, everybody wrote him off. On the outside, this guy probably couldn't buy a drink at the store, in our cases, or he probably couldn't do things that everyone else could do. He, just like the woman at the well, she probably, she had her own time slot. She went to the well. It wasn't because that's what time she went. No, it was the shame. It was the ridicule. It was the way others, Christians, the other Christian people treated someone without Christ, right? In that day, it wasn't like that, but I'm making that example here. She had to go to the well at noon. Much of it was her own fault. Much of it was because she had lived her life in sin so much that not only did she separate herself from God, but she separated herself from people and her family. And that's why Jesus actually didn't just tell her, hey, I'm the Messiah, now go tell everybody. He had a process that he went through with her. She had to see her sins for what they were, and she had to know who she was talking to. And through that, you see a change in her because you don't meet Jesus Christ and not have a change. And so I just want to point out that whenever he says Samaritans, they were actually people that, um, that it was Jews that were um, that mixed with another race that was part of them that had to be destroyed in the beginning. So that's why, that's why they were outcast by the people, right? And that's why Jesus is trying to, he's trying to correct that here in his parable he's saying that we don't we don't toss people because of what they look like we don't toss people because they were born in a certain place or a certain way we don't do that we actually embrace those people and bring them in and we'll see that and but a certain samaritan so we're still talking about the sick guy on the road um and the two priests have passed by they've made they've made their trip They've made their journey longer in order to walk around someone who needed their help. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Um, compassion is something that is very important. We see compassion in every aspect of Jesus' life. Every aspect, he had compassion on people. <clears throat> And went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an end. And he took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he, he took out two pence, and he gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. So, look, Jesus is telling him, this guy, he asked, he said, who, who, is, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And, uh, and, you know, and Jesus gives him a story of, you know, two priests and a Samaritan that see the same guy on the road. And this Samaritan goes out of his way. But I want I want y'all to I want y'all to understand that this is what Jesus Christ did for us. It's not just a story he's telling. You see, when when Matt was on the side of the road, whenever I was um, whenever I was When I fell among the thieves and I was stripped down and wounded and half dead spiritually um, in my life, you know, there were many people that passed by. There were many people that went across the street. But there was one man. There was one man that actually showed compassion and he went he came to me and he bound my wounds and he poured his oil in me 
Testament in the Bible oil is always the Holy Spirit. Always the Holy Spirit. It represents the representation of the Spirit of God. He poured his oil in me and wine. I had the communion in his, with his blood. I was washed in his blood. And he set me on his own beast. I no longer have my own vehicle, but I am actually riding with God now. And so, and he brought him to an end. You see the place, and he, and he took care of him. The, he didn't just bound my wounds. He didn't just help me for a moment. He didn't just take care. He, take, he took care of everything. He took care of all of it. And, and when they, he departed, he took two pence. And he gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him. Whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Understand that Jesus Christ did this on that cross when he said, Hey, I'm dying for every sin he's going to commit today and tomorrow and from here in the eternity. When I come again, I'll make everything right. You know, it's a, it's a very, very, very interesting way to look at it because it's exactly what Christ is describing. It's how we're supposed to act on earth towards our fellow man, no matter who they are. They're hurting. If they're in a bad place, if they need help, we show compassion. We show compassion, and we reach out with the hand of Jesus Christ to help them up. We don't have to take them in. We don't have to adopt them. We don't have to do any of that. But with where we were going and what we read just at the very beginning of this passage um, was about the harvest and about the work that needs to be done. And as Christians, whenever we proclaim Jesus Christ as our Savior, whenever we are proclaiming that we have something that other people don't, and we pass on the other side of the road to avoid showing compassion and to avoid helping someone we don't want to help, uh, understand that we're not living as Christ lived. We're not living his example, that at that very moment, we are living on our own. And we, are, we are disregarding what Christ commands us to do, what he asks us to do, because if we've, if we've taken everything and we've cast it to the side to follow Jesus Christ. There's no reason why a hurting person should not see our hand of help if God gives us that opportunity. I'm not saying go to the hospitals and try to find hurt people. That's different. God places people in our paths. People there for specific reasons. It may not be a reason today. It may not be a reason tomorrow. But everyone comes in and out of our lives for specific even the, sore, the, the sick, poor, broke person that just needs a hand up for a moment. You do not, you cannot and do not know the impact that that has, not just on the person's life, but on your life. There's chain reactions that begin to happen as soon as someone obeys the laws of God, shows compassion, and does the work of Jesus Christ. It happens every day. The more we actually begin to read and study and know how Jesus handled people, how he loved and how he cared, how he showed compassion and how he helped, um, makes this life makes this life worth living, because we're actually living as our Father wants us to live. When we're li we're living in the image of His precious Son, so we know. Whenever we are living in these ways, we know that we have God's favor on our lives because God showed favor on his son. Don't mistake me. His son still died a gruesome death. That, you know, but throughout his life, he was showed favor to the point that he could say, Father, forgive them that they know not what they do, even in that gruesome death. That's where we need to be as Christians. That's where we need to strive to be as Christians. That we know that this life is not going to magically get better. We know that this life, in this life, that all the bad things, that the circumstances of bad things around us, simply committing to Christ and believing on Him does not change 
everything around us, the physical things, the circumstances. Tomorrow your bills are still going to be due. You know, uh, if, you, if you have a cancer, it may still be there tomorrow. If a family member's hurt, they may still be hurt tomorrow. If there's strife in the family, it's still going to be there. But what Christ does is he cleanses you from the inside out. So if that family member, if there's strife, well, then it's up to you to go get them and go talk to them. Why? Because you're reborn in the image of Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ didn't have strife with anybody. You know, if someone's hurting, if, if, if circumstances, we begin to submit those things, truly submit them to God. We still have to work. We still have to do. We have to live our lives. We have to be responsible. We have things that we must do in life that to be responsible and do and be productive. But none of those things should take a precedence over God. And too often, that's what we're focusing on is everything else. And we only focus on God when we are hurt, when you're sick, when we get a bad phone call, when things are not going well. Uh, God tells us that when things are going great, to focus on him. And, you know, if that happens, when that, when that happens and things are going great and we are completely focused on God, circumstances around us are still going to present themselves. People are still going to get hurt. Things, bad things are still going to happen, maybe even to you. But there is a difference that cannot be explained unless you have Christ in you and you are feeling you're, you are being filled with the Holy Spirit of God because the things that hit this body, the things that destroy me as a physical human being here do not destroy my inside, who I am, because I am standing. My standing is in Jesus Christ. My flesh is in the world, but my standing is in Jesus Christ. My substance is in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul keeps praying, is that Christ would increase and I would decrease. That it's not me who's doing these things, but Christ in me. We have to be filled. And Jesus tells us how to do that. In the process of reading his word, in the process of praying, rejoicing in the spirit, knowing when, uh, knowing when the devil's trying to attack and getting to your word, getting to God. And getting those things out. Just like Jesus asked the question to the man to draw out the correct answer. In, we do the same thing. When, the Satan, when Satan attacks, when he gives us a temptation, we go to God. It's like asking Satan a question. He'll answer his own. And then by the time we're done with God, whatever Satan gave us, we don't even think about it no more. I mean, at the end of this, the man just went on his way, right? And that's what we want Satan to do in our lives. We're not gonna, we're not gonna kill him. We're not gonna beat him down. That's all. That's all God's job. He's got it. He's already wrote the end of the book. What do we need to do? Endure to the end. Be faithful. Read, study, pray, and show compassion. If you, if you're on this side of the road and you see someone on that side of the road hurting, go. To that side to help them because someone helped you whether it's a human or god almighty himself someone bound your wounds and made you whole again so we can't just pass people by daily let's pray father we thank you for your message we thank you for always supplying our needs Lord, we, we pray that you would begin to help us to be filled with your spirit, that we may become the hands and the feet of your son, that we would show compassion for our fellow man, that we would be there to help them when you provided the way for us to be there, when you opened the door for us to be there. Lord, we, we thank you for all that you do and the, the lives that you change and the miracles that you work. Lord, we've seen so many. We thank you for always providing. 
Lord, we ask that you bless the service next door and continue to work. Lord, I pray that you would begin to answer questions for those who are asking. Lord, that you would begin to really pull your disciples close. Lord, if anyone's not standing solidly on the rock of Jesus Christ, we ask that you would get them there today. We thank you for all that you do, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right.